In occupied France during World War II, Arsenal d'Aeronautique found itself building German engines under occupation, specifically the Junkers Umo 213. That engine was a liquid-cooled inverted V12, about 35 liters, making roughly 1,750 horsepower at 3,250 RPM in its main variant. After the war, Arsenal didn't just stop. They kept developing it and built their own 2,300 horsepower version as the Arsenal 12H. During the war, Junkers had also toyed with a bigger engine on paper, the UMO 212 and H24 built around the UMO 213 components. It never got built, but it followed the same idea as the Hispano Suiza's 24Y and 24Z H24 engines. Whether Arsenal took inspiration from those or just arrived at the same conclusion, they decided to build their own H24 based on 12H parts. That project became the Arsenal 24H. Think of the 24H as two V12s stacked into a vertical H, two cylinder banks up top, two below, all bolted to a two-piece aluminum crankcase split vertically down the center. Unlike the 12H where the blocks were cast into the crankcase, the 24H used separate aluminum blocks with detachable heads. Each head had two intake valves and one exhaust valve, all run by a single overhead cam per bank, driven by a vertical shaft at the rear. Inside, there were two crankshafts spaced far enough apart that a shaft could pass between them, handy if you ever wanted to couple engines in tandem. Each crankshaft drove one upper and one lower bank, with six throws and seven main bearings. Pistons ran a modest 6.5 to 1 compression ratio and used fork and blade connecting rods. At the back of the engine sat two single-stage two-speed superchargers driven by a cross shaft at the accessory section. They had automatic boost and gear control. One supercharger fed the upper banks, the other fed the lower banks, and each intake manifold had an aftercooler built in. A fuel injection pump lived between each pair of banks, and the engine could also be run with water injection for short bursts of extra power. Ignition was via two spark plugs per cylinder, fired by a pair of magnetos mounted ahead of the engine, above the propeller reduction gearbox. The prop shaft sat right on the engine's centerline and turned through a 0.4165 to 1 reduction. Arsenal even designed a contra-rotating gearbox for the 24H, but it's not clear if it was ever actually built. Every surviving photo shows a standard single-rotation propeller. Mechanically, the 24H shared a lot of DNA with the 12H. Cylinder heads, valve train parts, most internals and accessories like superchargers, pumps, and magnetos were common across the family. The bore was 150 mm and the stroke was 165 mm, for a total displacement just under 70 liters. Pushed hard with water injection and 11 psi of boost, the 24H hit 4,000 horsepower at 3,250 rpm for takeoff. Without water injection, it made about 3,500 horsepower at the same speed with lower boost. In cruise, depending on altitude and supercharging gear, you were down in the neighborhood of 2,000 to 2,200 horsepower. Physically, it was a beast, just under 10 feet long and about 4 feet wide and almost 5 feet tall and weighing a bit over 4,000 pounds. Detailed design work kicked off in December 1945, and by April 1946, the first crankcase casting had been delivered, and the prototype engine was assembled at Arsenal's factory in Chatelon near Paris. The first run happened in May 1946, and by November, it was on display at the Paris Salon d'Aeronautique. Problems with the Hispano Suiza 24Z led the French to select the Arsenal 24H for the SE 580 fighter, but that airframe was canceled in 1947 before any installation happened. At least three prototype engines were built, and between them they ran more than 1,600 hours on the test stand, hitting a full 4,000 horsepower target. For flight testing, two 24H engines were installed in the inner positions on the Sud Est SE 161P7 Languedoc airliner, replacing the inner pair of Pratt & Whitney R1830 Twin Wasp radials. The 24Hs drove 10.5-foot diameter fully adjustable five-blade props. The modified Languedoc first flew the 24Hs in 1948. The engines themselves performed well, but the props were simply too small to absorb the full 4,000 horsepower each engine could deliver. Meanwhile, jets were rapidly taking over. By 1950, there was no real market left for a brand new 4,000 horsepower piston engine, and the 24H program was shut down. Before we get too far ahead, it's worth pausing on why France even cared about an engine like this in the first place. Right after the war, everyone could see jets were coming, but they weren't ready to replace everything overnight. France was rebuilding an aviation industry that had been bombed, looted, and scattered. In that gap, big piston engines still had real value, as power plants for interim fighters, bombers, transports, and flying test beds, while jet and turboprop programs spun up. Post-war France also didn't yet have the industrial base to churn out large jet turbines in volume, but it did have deep experience with piston engines, so taking a proven platform like the 12H 
scaling it up and squeezing more power out of it was a logical bridge technologically, while the rest of the industry caught up. When you look at the 24H, you can tell Arsenal was basically asking, how far can we push piston technology before it stops making sense? And the 24H is right on that edge. Fork and blade rods, dual superchargers, complex gearing, it's very much in line with the late war max effort engines like the Merlin, Allison, and others, just taking a step further in size and power. Cooling a 70 liter H24 was always going to be a challenge, and Arsenal had to get creative. Coolant passages were cast directly into the blocks, detachable heads made major work at least somewhat sane, and those aftercoolers in the intake manifolds helped keep charge temperatures under control at high boost. And they paired all of this with water injection, which is what kept detonation in check when they pushed for 4,000 horsepower at takeoff. Another big theme with the 24H was modularity. Arsenal deliberately reused as many 12H components as possible, heads, camshafts, and a lot of internal hardware and accessories. That meant you weren't designing every part from scratch, and in theory, spares for a 12H could help keep a 24H running. For a country rebuilding its industry, that was a very pragmatic way to develop a big engine family without needing huge production runs. Arsenal already had experience with tandem engine setups from the VB10 fighter, which used two engines mounted in the fuselage driving coaxial contra rotating props through a special flexible coupling. They took that tandem drive logic and applied it to the 24H. In the 24H's tandem layout, the rear engine's prop shaft passed through the gap between the two crankshafts and then right through the front engine's prop shaft, so each engine could drive one set of the two coaxial propellers. Put together, the tandem 24H displaced about 140 liters, with some sources quoting up to 8,000 horsepower. With a short shaft between the two engines, the whole assembly weighed just over 9,000 pounds. Some sources state that at least one 24H tandem was actually assembled and run on the test stand, but that's not universally confirmed in the literature. All that power and mass meant only very large aircraft could realistically use it. The engine was proposed for a handful of big transports and flying boats, including designs like the Sudest SE-1200 Transatlantic Flying Boat with four tandem 24Hs, and Latakore projects that would have used eight single 24Hs. None of those aircraft were ever built, and once the basic 24H was cancelled, the tandem versions faded away with it. In a way, the Arsenal 24H is the last big swing of classic piston engine thinking. A straight line evolution from early rotaries to multi row radials to supercharged V12s and finally to huge H block monsters trying to wring out the last possible jump in power. The 24H hit that limit enormous output, enormous complexity, and a world that was already moving on to turbines. The engine never went into serious production. Today it mostly survives in photos, drawings, and a few preserved components and references in museums and archives. A reminder of the brief moment right after the war when people were still trying to solve tomorrow's problems with yesterday's technology.